Good morning. It's good to see everybody. This is an exciting day, isn't it? For a couple of reasons. First of all, we um, get to worship together in freedom and liberty today. Isn't that awesome? That in this country we can worship together today. We can worship God together. That we can come together as a community of Christ followers, as a community of believers, and worship the Lord. That's, that's first and foremost. That's that we, we ought to be excited about that. That ought to make us jump and yell and scream and shout. And then secondly... It's opening season for NFL. I mean, it's, it's, you weren't as excited about Jesus as you, maybe I need to preach a different message today, but anyway, we, uh, we really are glad that you're here, know that God has a good word for you today. Let me mention something very quickly to you, you just saw it on our video announcements, and that is our community groups. This is a kickoff weekend, not only for NFL, but more importantly, our community group sign up. So this whole month of September, we'll be signing up for our community groups. If you've never signed up for a community group before, let me just quickly share with you, we have 37 different groups this semester that will meet between October and the first part of December, 10 weeks, 10 to 12 weeks. And there, there's a group for about everybody and anything from Bible studies to connect groups to different activity groups and all kind of fun things to be a part of volleyball groups and all kind of things. So you got a catalog when you came in. All you need to do is uh, sign up. You can sign up by uh, when you leave today. There will be several people that will be out in our lobby next to the banners that say community groups. They'll have iPads. You can just stop right there. They'll be able to sign you up right that moment. Uh, for the group of your choice, and um, if you want to take a little time this afternoon to figure out which group you want to sign up for, then you can do that at home as well. You can go to our website, lower right-hand corner, there's a flash box there that says community group sign up. So you can click on that, and it'll take you right to the page to help you sign up for a group as well. So we want everybody to sign up, and, and you know, uh, community groups, it's not just an activity, and we're not just a church that just has small groups, we're a church of small groups. And we believe that small groups are critical, community groups are critical for the life of the believer. It's not just something fun that we do and hang out and get to know people. That's a part of it, the relational aspect. But studies have shown over and over again that people grow best when they are in community together. Not just studies, but the Bible teaches that in Acts. That people grow best, that they meet together in the temple, and then Acts says that they also met together from house to house. They were in community together. So sign up for a group. It really is life-changing and will help you grow tremendously spiritually. We've been in our series called Wrestling with God, and we've been looking at the story of Jacob. And it's been a fascinating story, and it's, it's kind of been a crazy story also that's been all over the map. And, and we've watched Jacob go from his birth, and when he was born, he came out grabbing his twin brother's heel. And Jacob actually means, his name means heel grabber, and he was known as a deceiver, as a as, uh, you know, kind of a, a, a guy who is always trying to get ahead in life. And so we see him grasping onto his brother's heel. And then we heard a message that, that talked about him stealing his brother's or, or, or cheating his brother out of his birthright. And uh, then we saw a couple of weeks ago where, where Jacob um, and his mom, Rebecca, that they had the time where they tried to deceive Isaac. Isaac and Esau, his older brother, had tried to take the blessing. Isaac was going to bless es- Esau, Rebecca heard about it and told Jacob that, that this is what dad was trying to do. And so they went in and deceived dad into giving the ble- blessing to Jacob, which then caused Jacob to be on the run. Jacob took off because his older brother Esau felt like he had just been cheated too many times by his younger brother. And so he set out to kill him. And so Jacob was on the run last week when we picked up the story. And he ended up in a hard place, in a desolate, desolate place, in a, a, a rocky place. And, and not just physically was he in this desolate, rocky place, but I mean emotionally and spiritually. I mean, uh, just, I mean, he was just worn out. He was just in this difficult place in life. And even physically, he was in such a rough spot that he laid his head down on a rock. He used a rock for a pillow. And it was in that hard place and it was in that difficult spot that he was in in his life that he had a dream about a stairway to heaven or a ladder that extended from heaven down to earth. And in that dream, he saw angels ascending and descending on the ladder. And it was God's message. It was God's, if you will, wake-up call for Jacob to begin to get his attention 
because Jacob had always been out for himself. He had always tried to circumvent the will of God. He had always tried to take matters into his own hand because he felt like, you know, his own hands, because he felt like God was distant and God was away. But God was revealing and even said to Jacob, Jacob, I want you to know that I gave your grandfather Abraham a promise and I gave your father Isaac a promise and that promise I'm giving to you also that your descendants are going to be like the dust of the earth and I am with you. And it was a critical moment of Jacob's life and we began to see this transformation and this turnaround in Jacob's life, although it's slow because change takes time, doesn't it? It's a slow transformation, but we saw Jacob beginning to interact and connect with God as he began to experience God's presence. And so Jacob now, we're going to see the story today, he arrives finally at his uncle Laban's house. In today's story, and as we pick up his, this message today, really we're going to kind of talk about Jacob a little bit, but we're going to focus on two other individuals, and that is Leah or Leah and Rachel, and that is the two women that Jacob ends up marrying in the story today. I'm telling you, when, I'm, I'm going to share the story with you here, and we're going to read it from Scripture together, and this is a dysfunctional story. I, I'm just telling you, this is like Jerry Springer stuff right here. I mean, it's, it's like Mari Povich. It's, I mean, you name it. This is a crazy, crazy story. But we're going to look at the life, and we're going to contrast the life of Leah and Rachel and some of the applications that we can draw from their life. But let's pick up the story at the beginning. In Genesis 29, verse 1, it says, Then Jacob hurried on, talking about from the place in Bethel where he had just been, finally arriving in the land of the east. He saw a well in the distance. Three flocks of sheep and goats lay in an open field beside it, waiting to be watered, but a heavy stone covered the mouth of the well. It was the custom there to wait for all the flocks to arrive before removing the stone and watering the animals. Afterward, the stone would be placed back over the mouth of the well. Jacob went over to the shepherds and he asked, Where are you from, my friends? Jacob was still talking with them when Rachel arrived with her father's flock, for she was a shepherd. And because Rachel was his cousin, and Rachel, I mean, let me just stop here. Rachel, I mean, Jacob, we're going to see Jacob was smitten by Rachel. I mean, it was love at first Sight. I mean, this is a kissing cousin story right here. I mean, they're literally cut. I mean, so afterward, the stone, uh, let, me, let me jump in. And because Rachel was his cousin, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and because the sheep and goats belonged to his uncle Laban, Jacob went over to the well and moved the stone from its mouth and watered his uncle's flocks. Flock. Uh, then Jacob kissed Rachel and wept out loud. Guys, bad idea on a first date. Let me just tell you, bad idea. If you meet a girl for the first time and you look at her, you're crazy attracted to her physically, you're crazy, don't walk up, kiss her, and then break down emotionally, hysterically crying, okay? Just, it's not a good idea. It doesn't work today. It may have worked then, but it doesn't work now. And, and he explained to Rachel that he was her cousin on her father's side, the son of her Aunt Rebecca, and so Rachel quickly ran to her father, Laban. Like I said, it was love at first sight. I mean, he was just captivated by her beauty, and we're going to see this, and you know, Christy and I, when we met for the first time, we were in Southeastern Bridal, I mean Bible College, and um, we were in Bible College together, and I remember it was 7.30 class, I had a class called Old Testament Survey, which I flunked out of, as a matter of fact, I flunked out of all my Bible classes, that's your pastor right here, yeah, the <laughs> Bible College flunky, and um, but I flunked out of that class. But, but I remember being so excited, wanting to go to the class, because when I first went to the cl class, Chrissy, I remember Chrissy, I was sitting kind of the middle row, middle section, and she came walking by me. And I'm when she walked by me the first time, I was like, wow, that is one of the most gorgeous girls I've ever seen in my life. I mean, I was just immediately attracted to her. She didn't even notice me. She didn't pay attention to me. I mean, it took me a while to get her attention. It took me a while to try to, you know, I mean, I don't know how many times I had to walk, you know, she, she, in her dorm, she had a window that looked out in the courtyard. I don't know how many times in the course of a day I had to walk by there, just hoping that at some point she would catch a glimpse of me, and like for her, you know, like it was for me, that would be love at first sight, you know, but it didn't exactly happen that way. But anyway, I mean, it, it took us a while. Matter of fact, we started dating, and this is apart from the story, but can you believe she actually tried to break up with me one time? <laughs> if you know my personality, I wasn't going to have it, and I said she tried to break up with me. I, I just looked at her. She said, you know, maybe, maybe we need to take a break for a while. I'm like, no. <laughs> no, not going to happen. She was like, she didn't even know what to do. She was like, um, 
okay, you know, all right. And so it wasn't long after that, I said, what we need to do is not take a break. You need to marry me. And so we end up getting married, and it's been the best thing that ever happened to her. <laughs> anyway, for, for Jacob, what are you laughing at? For Jacob, it was that moment. It was that, you know, air supply playing in the background. You know what I mean? He's got the music. You can hear the music. He's just, he falls in love with her the first time he sees her. He's just so taken back by her looks. But we're going to see in the story that he was so taken by her physically that he never really got to know who she was internally. And there were some real problems. I mean, Rachel has some real challenges, some real problems that we're going to see. So verse 13 goes on to say that as soon as Laban heard that his nephew Jacob had arrived, he ran out to meet him. He embraced and kissed him and brought him home. And when Jacob had told him his story, Laban exclaimed, you really are my own flesh and blood. After Jacob had stayed with Laban for about a month, Laban said to him, you shouldn't work for me without pay just because, hey, we're, just because we're family, just because we're relatives, you shouldn't work without pay. Tell me how much your wages should be. Now Laban had two daughters. You see where this is going, don't you? Now Laban had two daughters. The older daughter was named Leah. Everyone say Leah. The younger was named Rachel. Everyone say Rachel. So we have two daughters, Rachel the younger, Leah the older, and there was no sparkle in Leah's eyes. Now I'm going to try to be as kind as I can with this, but I want you to know what the context of this means. When it says that there was no sparkle in Leah's eyes. This is the translator in the New Living Translation trying to be as kind as possible to say, this girl was an ugly duckling. I mean, he really is. He's trying to be nice in this, but, but this girl had issues. Actually, part of the translation, she actually had a lazy eye. As she wasn't, this wasn't the girl. I mean, she would look at you and the eye would just, woo, it would go somewhere else. You know, I mean, just, I mean, she, she had no sparkle. That was the translator's way of saying, you know, this girl was not the most attractive in the whole world. I mean, this is, you know, anyway, I have all kind of things running through my head that I'm not going to say. But, 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 but she wasn't attractive. There was no sparkle in her eyes. But Rachel, Rachel had a beautiful figure and a lovely face. Rachel had a beautiful figure, a lovely face. And since Jacob was in love with, with Rachel, he told her father, I'll work for you for seven years if you'll give me Rachel, your younger daughter, as my wife. Agreed, Laban said. I'd rather give her to you than anyone else. So stay here and work with me. And so Jacob worked seven years to pay for Rachel. Look at this. But his love for her, this is like stuff made in a movie right here. But his love for her was so strong that it seemed like only a few days. Do you see like a notebook moment right here? Like, I mean, getting ready to cry. You're getting, I mean, this is, this is just a crazy, crazy deal right here. I mean, it, uh, it, you know, it, oh, the, the seven years just passed by so fast. It was only like a few days because I was, uh, of course, I mean, he was looking at her every day. And can you just imagine the crazy stuff that was going through his head? And so verse 21, finally the time came, seven years later, finally the time came for him to marry her. And he said, I fulfill my agreement. Now give me my wife so I can sleep with her. That's every guy thinks that. You know, he's not thinking for seven years, he's watching this beautiful, attractive, great figure, you know, I mean, just gorgeous, walks by, and he's like, seven years. I mean, he's counting down. It may have only seemed like a few days, but I'm telling you what, he's got a calendar where he's marking down the days. So finally, he said, give me my wife so I can sleep with her. So Laban invited everyone in the neighborhood. Sounds like a pretty cool story, you know, I mean, love at first sight, it's all going really good. So Laban invited everyone in the neighborhood and prepared a wedding feast. But that night, when it was dark, Laban took Leah to Jacob, and he slept with her. Laban, I know, there's kind of like a, ah, can't even believe it's happening, right? Laban had given Leah a servant, Zilpah, to be her maid. But when Jacob woke up in the morning, it was Leah. He thought it was Rachel, but it was Leah what have you done to me, Jacob raged at Laban. He said, I worked for seven years for Rachel. Why have you tricked me? It's not our custom here, Laban said. He said, it's not our custom for the younger daughter to go ahead of the firstborn or to marry off the younger daughter ahead of the firstborn. But wait until the bridal week is over, then I'll give you Rachel too, provided, it's a little condition, provided you work for me for another seven years. Crazy story here, isn't it? Look at this, look at this. Jacob, the heel grabber, the deceiver, all of a sudden is getting a little taste of his own medicine by Uncle Laban, who is as crafty as any of them. 
I mean, I mean, if Jacob is the deceiver, he has met his match here in his uncle Laban. I, can you see how crazy? This family was never looking out for each other. I mean, they were looking at how they could get each other. And what's so ironic about this story, when I say that Jacob is getting a little bit of his own mes- medicine, think about this on the wedding night. He thinks it's Rachel. I mean, everything, you, I, I mean, we're not all stupid. We know what happens on the wedding night. You know what I mean? On the wedding night, it's dark. He reaches out. He's touching Leah. I mean, I can see him caressing her face, her hair, her arms. I mean, he's just all over her, but it's dark. You know, it's, it's, it's dark. There's, and so all of a sudden, he wakes up in the morning and realizes that he's been duped. And do you remember? Let's just rewind. If you weren't here a couple of weeks ago, I'd encourage you to go back online and check out the message. It'll help you understand this story with a little more clarity. Two weeks ago, Rebecca, Jacob's mom, and Jacob put together this plan and scheme to dupe Dad. And when Dad reached out, he thought he was touching Esau. He thought he was reaching out. Remember, he rubbed those hairy arms, but, you know, I mean, Jacob, you know, remember Jacob was a metrosexual one. He had the smooth arms and the, I mean, he, but he had put on Esau's clothing. And so here, Jacob was, I mean, Jacob had deceived And Jacob was being deceived almost in the same way that he had deceived his dad. And what's ironic in this story, and this is the the thing that we see, is that night at Bethel that we talked about last week, where he has an encounter with God, this experience where he sees the house of God or Bethel, the house of God or the presence of God. He has this encounter with God. And what's remarkable about that is we start to see at least a little hint of transformation that begins to take place. And this is going to be the cool stuff that we're going to see in his life coming up we see his life unfold is that there's some change taking place in his heart a little bit because although he was enraged with Laban Laban says hey you know what you've got to work for me another seven years if you want Rachel and what I love about this story is and I'm sure that Jacob started reflecting back to maybe months earlier where he had deceived his dad and the Lord was beginning to teach him helping to begin to mature him in life and help begin to realize that there are consequences to deception And so we don't see Jacob arguing whatsoever. He doesn't argue about it. He just agrees to do it. And I also just want to stop and take a time out and talk about marriage for a second. Christy and I, just two weeks ago, we celebrated 25 years of being married. And uh, and I can can tell you, after 25 years, we're we're happier now than we've ever been before. I'm more fulfilled now in my marriage than I ever have been before. And part of that is just because my kids are older and almost out of the house. And um, I'm just joking. We're a tight family. But... But, you know, um, for Christy and I, we, we had our struggles. We had our ups and downs. And even when we got married, we got married and we were young. I mean, we were young, stupid, and in love. We got married at 18. But when we got married, you know, like so many of you, we had our preconceived ideas of what marriage was going to be like. I mean, if I'm being really blunt for the guy, he thinks, you know, that when you get married, it's going to be sex 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you know. I mean, whenever you're ready to roll, you're ready to roll, you know. And, and for the woman, she thinks, oh, all of a sudden I found Mr. Right, and it's, this is going to be great. I mean, it's going to be constant romance. He's going to always do the dishes. He's going to always mow the yard. He's going to always help me wash the clothes. He's going to help me be a care. I mean, he's going to help do all these things. And all of a sudden, you get married, and you realize things are a little bit different. Like for Jacob, I mean, he had this idea, and this ideal in Rachel, he got married and realized it was a little bit different than what he thought. And he woke up next to Leah. And I think all marriages have their moments where you wake up next to Leah. No matter how beautiful that person is or how handsome they may be, you wake up and you realize this isn't all I thought it was going to be. This isn't all, you know, I, I, I had these other ideas, but it's in those moments, and I can tell you from our marriage and the things that we've lo- learned is that we, 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 we love each other deeply, but in the hard times and in the struggles, especially early on in our first seven years, I can tell you that The emotions weren't always there. The great feelings of love and romance and all those things, they weren't always there. But it was commitment that kept us together. It was commitment. And commitment has got to be that place that you always go to, even when the emotions and feelings, even when you have the days where you wake up and you're like, whoa, I thought I married Rachel, but this is Leah. This is different. This is not what I expected. It's commitment that helps you get through those tough moments. It's commitment that helps you get through those difficult times. And for Leah, I mean, Leah's, I mean, let's not look at Leah as an innocent bystander here because she was part of the whole plan of deception. 
Look at verse 28. So Jacob agreed to work seven more years. And a week after Jacob had married Leah, Laban gave him Rachel too. And Laban gave Rachel a servant, Bilhah, to be her maid. And so now Jacob's beginning to feel what it's like to be deceived. Verse 30, so Jacob slept with Rachel too. Listen to this right here. And he loved her much more than Leah. He loved her much more than Leah. He then stayed and worked for Laban the additional seven years. Have you ever felt like you were in second place? Anybody ever struggled with feeling like there's always somebody that is ahead of you? I, I know for me, just kind of a funny story, but it carried with me for a little while as a kid growing up. <clears throat> I was third, from third grade to sixth grade. I was in a school, Gulfstream Elementary in Miami. And while I was in school, I had a, my best friend in school was a guy by the name of Randall Hill. And Randall and me, I mean, we just ran together. We played together. We were great friends. I mean, we were just super, super close. And, but Randall was just always a little better at everything. And it just frustrated me. I mean, you know, I, in field days. I used to love field days. You remember field days when you were in elementary school? Anybody remember field days? You were either the one that was out there running around like the maniac or you were the one sitting up against the, you know, brick wall or the concrete wall just, you know, not wanting any part of it. But I was, I was the one that was out there running around because I love field days because I wanted to win the ribbon. I had that competitive edge in me. I, I wanted to win the ribbon. But the problem was from third grade to sixth grade, it didn't matter how hard I tried, I always won second place. And man, I'm just telling you, it would frustrate me. You'd go in my room, and man, it was awesome. You just, you would look in my room, and it would just be riddled with all these red second place ribbons. Then you go in Randall's room, and you look at Randall's, and here's the trophies, and here's the fastest guy, and here's all the first place ribbons, and all the same events. And although we were always such good friends and such close friends, there was always a little bit of a resentment inside of me because he always just seemed a little bit better than me. And that's the story, and that's the conflict that we're having between Rachel and Leah, is that Jacob loved Rachel more. Jacob, Rachel was the one that he had love at first sight with. I mean, and Leah was the one that he just got duped into marrying. And so Leah always, because of her looks, because of who she was, because of the deception, she was the one that was always in second place. Rachel the prom queen, the captain of the cheerleading squad, the homecoming court. I mean, that was always Rachel. Leah was always in the background, felt like she was in second place, not always the most popular, not always the one getting the attention, the one with the lazy eye that people made fun of all the time. And we all have those moments, and, and you know what I've realized is that even people that are the ones that are always in first place, there's always somebody else ahead of them. And that we feel those feelings of inferiority from time to time. And we feel like we're in second place. We feel like we have a hard time getting ahead. And when we feel that way, what we start to do is we start to compare ourselves with other people. For me, I would compare myself. I'd compare myself to Randall. I wish I was as fast as Randall was. I wish I could do this like Randall. I wish I could do that like Randall. And maybe that sounds childish when you're in, you know, third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade. It might sound childish. But those same attitudes and those same uh, thoughts and that same thought pattern carries on over into life because then when we get older, we start saying things like this. Man, I, 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 wish I, had, I wish I had that husband. I wish I had that wife. I wish I had those kids. I wish I had that job. I wish I had those gifts. I wish I had those abilities. I wish I had those talents. I wish I had that money. I wish I had that car. I wish I had that boat. I wish I had that house. And so you end up living your life feeling inferior to the people around you. And you feel, well, I'm, I'm just telling you those feelings because the enemy comes in and the enemy blows those things out of proportion and makes them so much larger than what they are. And it makes you not only feel inferior, but causes you to feel unloved, uncared for. And that was Leah, unloved, uncared for. One version actually says, I mean, the, the language is a little softer here in the New Living Translation, but it actually, you know, Rachel, that, that Jacob loved Rachel and hated Leah. So, I mean, so here's Leah going through her life feeling unloved, feeling uncared for. And then it says in verse 31 that when the Lord saw that Rachel, when, when the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he enabled her to have children. And let me just, and let me just encourage you today that if you feel like you're that person that's in second place, 
and you feel like you're the one that can never get ahead, that, that your life is riddled with second, third, fourth, fifth place, fifth place ribbons, or even last place ribbons, and there's always somebody better than you, let me just encourage you in this situation that God sees you when you feel like nobody notices you, nobody cares, nobody understands what you're going through, nobody uh, you know, loves you or any of those things, God sees you. God sees you, and that ought to be the biggest encouragement for you today, that regardless, even if all those things are true, which most of the things that you're believing right now about what other people think about you, they're not true. But even if that were all true, the confidence that you have here today, even when you leave, is that God sees you and he loves you. He sees you. He loves you. He enables you. He encourages you. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he enabled her to have children, but Rachel could not conceive. So you have Rachel, who is extremely loved by Jacob, but she can't have kids. But then Leah now, so Leah became pregnant, verse 32, so Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And she named him Reuben. This is going to be critical. She named him Reuben, for she said, the Lord has noticed my misery, and now my husband will love me. Verse 33, she soon became pregnant again and gave birth to another son. And she named him Simeon, for she said, the Lord has heard me, and I was unloved, and now he has given me another son. And then she became pregnant a third time, and she gave birth to another son, and she named him Levi. And she said, surely this time, surely now my husband will feel affection for me, since I have given him three sons. Once again, verse 35, Leah became pregnant and gave birth to another son, and she named him Judah, for she said, now I will praise the Lord. And she stopped having children. So Leah, able to have kids, but so in despair in her life because she feels unloved. And so what does she do? Look what she does. So what she ends up beginning to do is she tries to fill the void. She tries to fill the void. Do you realize that there is a God-sized void in all of us? There's a void. You guys with me here this morning? There's a void that we all have in our lives that only God can satisfy and only God can meet. It's a void in all of our lives. And for, Ray, for Leah, she thought, well, I've got this void on the inside of me, and I guess if I can have children, then it will satisfy the void, and then it'll get my husband to notice me. I've talked with people and counseled with them in the past, and people who, you know, their, their marriages are on the rocks, and they're struggling in their marriage, and, and rather than working on their marriage, and rather than bringing their marriage to a place where it's solid and can withstand the storms of life, they say things like this, well, maybe if we have kids, it'll bring us together. Maybe, maybe if we have kids, it'll bring us closer together. That is not the reason to have kids. That is not the reason to start a family. You don't start a family hoping that maybe you'll get closer. But I, I'm just telling you because kids bring strain on marriage early on. They do, as much as you love them and care for them. And, I mean, young kids, they bring strain on marriages. And so if you think, well, if I, I'll just have kids and that'll make us even closer, it doesn't work that way. But for Leah, that's what she thought. If I can have kids, and, and, and the, solution, the, the solution to feeling unloved and uncared for and unwanted in second place, second rate, the solution to all of those things is actually in the name of the four boys. She has four children, okay? Hang in here with me. Everybody good? Okay. She has four kids. The very first one, she names him Reuben. Reuben means this, maybe now he'll see me. The Lord has seen me. Now maybe my husband will see me. Maybe now he'll notice me. So she has the first one, Reuben, and she's thinking to herself, now, 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 that, you know, now, that, now that I've had a son, because Rachel, you know, the sister who does it all and the sister who's, who's great at everything, she can't have kids. So now maybe because I've given him a son, he'll love me. Maybe now he'll see me. But that doesn't happen. Jacob loves Rachel. So she has another son, and she names him Simeon. And his name means, uh, maybe now he'll hear me. So she has Reuben, you know, maybe now my husband will see me. Maybe now, you know, through, through Simeon, maybe now my husband will hear me. And then she has a third son by the name of Levi. And his name means affection or attached to. You know, my husband, now that I've given him a third son, you know, maybe, maybe he'll see me now, maybe he'll hear me now, maybe now because I've given him three sons, he'll be attracted to me, he'll have affection for me, he'll be attached to me. And she, look what she's doing, she's trying to fill the void. She's trying to fill the void that only God can satisfy, trying to have all the kids thinking that maybe, you know, somebody will notice that maybe her husband will love her when she doesn't realize that that type of unconditional love is only found in God. And so then finally she gets to the point. She says, you know, I've had three boys. 
you know, I've tried to get him to see me. I've tried to get him to hear me. I've tried to get him to be attracted to me and attached to me. And none of that has worked. I've reached out so much for his love, for his, you know, love. And, and it's conditional. And I, I can't even get his love. And then she has the fourth child. And she names him Judah or praise or I will praise the Lord. So she finally reaches the point. She says, forget about it. I'm not trying to seek the love of Jacob and trying to get him to hear me, see me, or be attached to me. Forget all of that. I'm just going to praise the Lord, and I'm going to reach out to his unconditional love. Judah. And Judah, or praise, is where Jesus shows up in our lives. When you jump over to Matthew chapter 1, there's the genealogy of Jesus as the story starts out in the New Testament. And it says, verse 1, it says, this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah. Verse 2 says that, that um, Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah. And then it goes for about 15 verses, and it lays out the genealogy of all the, this was the father of so-and-so, and this was the father of so-and-so. And it was all tied back to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Judah at the beginning in verse 2. And you go through all those verses, and it gets all the way down in Matthew chapter 1 to see the lineage of Jesus that then comes through Joseph, that came through Judah, that came through Abraham. Because Jesus comes through praise. He shows up in our lives in praise. He shows up when our attention is on him, when we make a determination in our life that I will praise the Lord, that my circumstances may not be what I think they ought to be, and I may feel unloved, and I may feel uncared for, and I may feel second rate, and I may have all the second, third, fourth place ribbons in my room, but I will praise the Lord. But I will praise the Lord. I will reach out to him because I will find my unconditional source in him because he is the only one that can satisfy and meet the void that I have in my life. Verse 30. Verse 30. Jenny, you can come on up. I, I've got to wrap this up here. I need about another 30 minutes. You guys willing to give me 30 more minutes? A lot, some of you, like three of you, yeah, and then the rest of you are like, I'm ready for lunch. You know? Just give me a couple seconds here. Verse 30. When Rachel saw that she wasn't having any children for Jacob, she became jealous of her sister. This blows my mind. Rachel has it all. Uh, Rachel has the complete love of Jacob, but she is so distracted. She is so caught up in the fact that she doesn't have what her sister Leah has that she gets so angry and she says to Jacob, give me children or I die. Give me children or I'll die. And Jacob, this is the first time, and he just, he's kind of furious and we just see him go off and he's like, oh, am I God? Who do you think I am? Do you, yeah, you think I'm the one that's preventing you? He's the one who has kept you from having children. It's not me. This blows my mind. I understand Leah a little bit. I understand her feelings of, of you know, being unloved, uncared for. I understand her emotions. I understand all of those things. But Rachel, here's what. She was ticked off because she couldn't have her own way. She had everything. She had the love of Jacob unconditionally. But she couldn't even receive his unconditional love because she was so discontent in life. She was so jealous of what her sister had that she couldn't even receive the love of her husband. And so what she does is she finally says, she just gets frustrated at the point. She says, you remember the servants? You remember when I read a few verses earlier? That Bilhah and Zilpah, they were servants that were given to Rachel and Leah. Well, Rachel takes her servant Bilhah and says, here, Jacob, just sleep with her. You just, just go ahead and have sex with her. Just, I mean, we'll have kids through her, and then they'll be my kids. And so Jacob, I mean, he's a man, you know what I mean? His wife is throwing this woman at him. He's like, okay, all right, I get, you know. And so he has, you know, sexual relations with her. And then Leah stops having kids. And so Leah does the same thing. So now Jacob is having all of these kids again, now with these two maidservants. And then there's another whole, and I don't have time to get into the other story. But finally, we see what happens is Rachel, Rachel continues to cry out to God. And finally, the Lord comes along. It says in verse 22 of chapter 30, that the Lord remembered Rachel's plight. Which is crazy to me in this story. 
I mean, she's discontent. She's whiny. She's, she's, she's a control freak. She's not happy in life. She can't even, you know, receive Jacob's love. But yeah, and that's why I love the story of wrestling with God, the story of Jacob, because in all the characters, whether it's Laban or, 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 or Jacob or Rebecca or Isaac, one of the greatest things we see, the story isn't even about the characters themselves. They're not the primary focus. The focus in all of this is on God. It's on God's mercy and on his grace that in spite of all of their stupidity, that God still, in moments where they're just being stupid, that God says, I just love you too much. I'm going to reach out to you. I'm going to show you grace. I'm going to extend mercy to you. God reaches down. And it's the same thing he does to us. In our moments of stupidity, even when we're, even when we're at our worst, it's in those moments that God still looks down and says, yeah, I, I still love you despite all of it. Despite the problems, despite the, the things you're struggling with and the things that are going on in your life, I... I see you differently than you see yourself. And he reaches out in love and compassion. And so he remembered Rachel's plight, and he opens up her womb, and Rachel has her son, first son that she's had, and she names him Joseph. Now this ought to make sense to you, because now you might, as you read later on in the story, you begin to connect the dots. This was the son that Rachel has, Joseph, and now you realize, remember when Joseph was sold into slavery by his older brothers? See, all those older brothers came from Zilpah, Bilhah, Leah, not Rachel. And so they hated him. And I'm sure it was because of the attitude that mom had. That's why they, I, I mean, you can read later on. You can kind of connect that yourself. But you would think that Rachel, she's so excited, she has a baby, and that she would name him something like Judah, or, or, or you, know, you know, praise the Lord, or glory to God, or his grace is extended to me, or God has shown mercy, that, that he would have a name that represents something like that, but she doesn't. Look at Rachel, and this, this is kind of the story of her life. So she became pregnant, and she gave birth, verse 22, verse 23. And she said, God has removed my disgrace, she said, and she named him Joseph, for she said, may the Lord add yet another son to my family. That's what Joseph means. May, may the Lord add another son or another to my family. So here God, isn't this crazy? God has just blessed her tremendously. God has just opened up her womb. And rather than being thankful, and this is what discontentment does in our lives. Rather than being grateful, God brings a miracle in our lives. And rather than being grateful, rather than being passionate and excited and saying, thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done, what discontent people do is they say, okay, Lord, I really appreciate it, but it's not enough. I want another one. It's not good enough. They're never content. And so we see Leah wrestling with despair, unloved, uncared for, second class, second rate, second place and Rachel the gorgeous beautiful jaw dropping but an incredibly terrible attitude and disposition of discontentment never happy never satisfied and here, here here's, here's uh, although their personalities were so dramatically different here's the common place for both of them is both of them needed to realize that complete satisfaction in life does not come through a child or having children or even in a marriage. It comes from God himself. Complete satisfaction in life comes through God. And some of you are here today and you're reaching out and you're struggling in life and you're so discontent where you are and you're so unhappy where you are or you're you're disillusioned by things that aren't true or you're disillusioned or maybe you feel like you're second place or in that position. You're so fixated on some of those things like Rachel and Leah that you fail to mention, at least for Rachel, that Jacob was over here loving you unconditionally all, all along and that God is over here and God is here today and he loves you unconditionally. I mean, I love when we sang that song earlier, love came down and set me free. I, I mean, it, that, that is the truth. It's the love of God. And the enemy tries to distract us and pull us away from the love of God because, see, it's the love of God and receiving the love of God that brings soul satisfaction. 
that brings happiness to our spirits, that brings happiness to our soul. And you show me people that are discontent in life and they're jealous of others and they're struggling and they feel unloved and uncared for, and I'll show you people who don't understand the magnitude of a loving Heavenly Father. So my challenge to you today is if you're wrestling with any of those things, and I'm wrapping it up, if you're struggling with any of those things or any of those areas today in your life, just stop, take a deep breath, let's pull everything into perspective and focus on the one thing that's the most important, and that is the love of God. The love of God that reaches down to us. The love of God that is extended to each and every single one of us that will satisfy our despair, that will satisfy our discontentment, that will satisfy everything in our life that we're longing for. Bow your heads, let me pray for you. Father, I pray for everyone in this room. God, I thank you that you are a God who loves us and reaches down to us. You have extended your arms to us by giving us your life. And today, Lord, we just call out to you and we thank you so much, Lord, that you're on our side and that like Leah, God, you see us, even when we feel unloved, that you reach out and you see us and you enable us. You encourage us, you bless us, you help us. And Lord, I pray for those that are here today that are struggling with feeling second, second rate or feeling like they're the Leah of the group, feeling like they can never get ahead of somebody else. God, I pray that you would show them, that you would look down on them, that you would show them your love and that you would satisfy that longing, that despair that they have. God, I pray for those that are like Rachel who just feel so jealous or discontent in life and just always feeling like there's not enough or they can never measure up. And God, I pray that you would help them see that there's the unconditional love of a father reaching down to them. God, I thank you that your promises are true and that even like last week, you never leave us, you never forsake us, you're always with us. And I pray, God, that today we would receive fully and completely the incredible love that you have for us. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Can we just thank the Lord by just putting our hands together and clapping and giving thanks to him today? God bless you guys.